than normally the case. You don't know what I have to say. Um, as you know, my name is Imran Arden. I don't know anything about any of you or what your expectations are from today. So to keep everybody on their toes, I will. Well, I will say that I can't people when I can see them. That's <laughs> all right. Don't worry about the lights. Just one minute. You know, I'm an economist. I'm not an engineer. Just one minute. <laughs> Fantastic? Okay, let's just adopt it all right. Thank you. So you can probably see the title of the talk's changed, but you'll be happy to hear that the substance hasn't. Um, I kind of freestyle. It's quite a dry subject matter, money. Obviously it's very interesting to everybody. No doubt you're all here educating yourself and you want to be able to find a job or do something entrepreneurial. But the actual credit crunch, who here has been to talk on the credit crunch in the last six months? Quite a few of you. Who here is from a financial background or is studying something from finance? Could you put them a bit higher? Okay. Right. So you guys are the experts. So I'll be able to pick on you, right? <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. Okay, so what are you going to experience over the next four to five minutes? Well, I'm not too sure, but I'll give you an idea. Um, this is about the origins of money. This is about the origins of the credit crunch. So we'll be going back to 2007. We're going back to the 1600s as well. We'll be looking to the future. Not literally, of course. And we'll be trying to draw some understanding out of what's been happening recently. And really you're going to hopefully walk away with more questions than answers. I was at university a long time ago, as you can probably tell. Um, and I went to university thinking that it was going to provide me with the answers, but actually I don't think that's what it's there to do. It's there to provide you with some direction, but with more questions once you've left. As long as you know where you're going, then you should be able to answer those questions. So this is part of that, and hopefully you get some value from this. Okay. Let me tell you just a little bit about First Ethical Charitable Trust. Um, I do a number of things in terms of my working life in order to earn money. And you'll be surprised here I don't get paid to do this. Uh, this is totally voluntary. Uh, I'm a private equity analyst. Anybody want to just tell everyone else what that is? Any volunteers? Guys in the front row. Guys in the front row are normally keen. <laughs> and they're normally mature students as well, you don't recall them. They came late. <laughs> okay, quite simply, we assess business opportunities, we find investors and we put the two together. It's not banking. It's not banking. It's actually something termed Muchara. That's Islamic terminology just for an investor and a business venture coming together and sharing risk in return. Okay, it's one of the fundamental principles of Islamic banking. But, you're not going to hear much in the way of Islamic terminology today, so I don't think it's necessary. See, the principles of Islamic finance are universal. There's no need really to couch them in overtly Islamic language. That's not to say, you know, we're hiding from anything here. But in order to, to start any myths or any barriers about this, we'll talk it in general terms without the jargon, so that we can try and impart as much understanding as possible. I'll try and pitch it at the right level as well. Obviously, some people will be a bit low, some people will be a bit high, but hopefully we'll get the mean. The Charitable Trust was established in 2002 in order to raise the level of education relating to Islamic finance principles within various levels of society, both Muslim and non-Muslim as well. So this is totally inclusive. This is the kind of thing we do on a regular basis. Uh, this year alone we presented at Edinburgh, Oxford, Bristol. Um, on Thursday we'll be in Manchester. A few weeks time we'll be doing Southampton and Portsmouth. Um, I get the task of doing all of that. Uh, I enjoy it. I like engaging with you guys. Um, there's, there's other people in the organisation who deal with more grassroots. Um, mindset, uh, some of the younger people as well. And we also educate people in industry too, as well. And this is all on a charitable basis. So hopefully that gives you a clear idea as to what we are about. Okay. Definition time. Person, second year, economic student, well volunteered. 
definition of credit crunch, please. I'm here to uh, take a question of people. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> definition of credit crunch. Or you can't get it wrong. Uh, people were in a short of money, and the world and uh, the world was coming into an end. Maybe <laughs> okay. do you say, and you could say that. Anyone else? Chat. Second chance. Strike two. Not enough liquidity in the economy. Does everybody understand that? Money, liquidity. No money. Okay, so restriction in funds. So we'll come back to this. We'll come back to the definition at the end after we've been through all of the 30 odd slides. Aren't you lucky? A sudden reduction in the availability of commercial credit which occurred around June 2007. Okay, pretty dry definition. So let's have a look at exactly what happened. Okay. So, go back a few years, banks are doing very well. Sorry, is this the right time? Is this booming a bit, vibrating? Can you hear me if I just talk like this? Yeah, no. Please let me Okay. Fine. Uh, so, banks are making a lot of money. So, on the left hand side, we have the subprime mortgage market. And on the right hand side, we have banks selling CDOs. Anyone CDO? Yes, sir. Very good. Collateralized debt obligation. First rule of finances, jargon is involved to keep you from understanding exactly what is going on. Okay? That simply means that let's say there are 10,000 people in the subprime mortgage market. They've all signed these contracts to repay a mortgage over 25 years. Let's collect those all together and sell them on the open market because they have some value, don't they? At the end of that 25 year period, people will have paid back more and they actually borrow it. Hey, if somebody else wants to buy it at a premium, then why not? Does that make sense? These are contracts which are sold in the open market. Collateralized debt obligation. Okay, then disaster. People couldn't afford to repay their mortgages. That's why they missed them subprime. What does that mean? That means money that's been lent out is not going to be paid back. There is a confidence crisis in the banking system. This panic spreads from the epicenter of the United States, all over the globe really, primary, and secondary and tertiary markets. But the ones highlighted there are the markets that are mainly affected. Why, why would those markets be mainly affected? Yes. Okay, yeah, I mean, one step on from that is that these are the countries that bought these contracts, these CDOs. That's why they'd be affected more than anybody else. You know the old thing about when the United States gets a cold? Sorry, when it sneezes, we, we get a cold. Yeah? So that's what happened, it sneezed, and everyone else got this cold. Because everyone had some piece of the US mortgage market. Who wouldn't want that? If you're a bank, Number one economy in the world, you want a piece of that market, so that's what they all do. 